Okay, welcome back everybody. This is Shalina Ayana with risingwoman.com and today I'm here with my lovely friend Nicole Lowe's. Uh, Nicole is a somatic experiencing practitioner and today we're going to talk to her about nervous system and trauma work. So welcome Nicole. Thank you. Excited to be here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of just go a little bit all over the place with nervous system stuff today because um, while understanding the nervous system and its involvement in um, healing trauma has been sort of known for quite some time, I feel like it's only now becoming really popular. And so I would love to have a little breakdown of somatic experiencing work in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, somatic, somatic experiencing is based off of Peter Levine's work. Um, it's quite complex, obviously there's a lot involved, but ultimately what we're looking at is our body's response to trauma. So trauma, to keep it simple, is an incomplete survival response. So our nervous system still believes that there's some sort of danger that we're having to protect ourselves from. So we're living in some sort of state of survival. So Peter has built um, I don't even want to call it a modality, but created a way to work with those incomplete survival responses, really paying attention to how we are stuck within those responses from a somatic approach. So getting less out of the into the story of it all and more into how our bodies are responding to being stuck in these survival patterns and how do we start to move through those so that we can be more regulated have more capacity be more resilient and ultimately just have more life force and be more of ourselves mm -hmm. i love that yeah let's talk about what you just said which is getting out of the story of it all mm -hmm. What comes up for me when you say that is that when we've been hurt, like when we've had some sort of trauma, when we've been betrayed, um, taken advantage of in any way, what I've experienced is that what I would do is build walls of protection and sort of put on an extra layer when I'm out in the world so that people can't get through. And then my way of defending my you know little bubble would be to tell stories to myself about how the world isn't safe or tell stories to myself about how people are a certain way and so because of my trauma or because of my past conditioning my lens for how everybody else in the world is or how they're going to treat me is already sort of predetermined yeah. that's what i experience the story as is that yeah okay well and on top of the story, I would also say that there's a visceral experience of that. So it's not only the story that's there, but it's also the felt experience of it that's there, right? The wall is there, that bubble of protection, mm -hmm. that seeing everything is dangerous. One of my other teachers, Kathy Kane, talks a lot about snakes, where it's like every stick, people perceive it as snakes, right? It's like, that's dangerous, that's dangerous, that's dangerous. It's not just a story, but it's also the actual living felt experience here. You're not only creating the story, your whole body's living in that experience of there's snakes everywhere versus there's st sticks everywhere. And right, I can see sticks, and then when there's a snake, I then respond into that whoa, I have to survive. This is dangerous mode. Yeah. So I would say that there's the story to it, and there's the felt experience. And some modalities will work a lot with changing the story, but if we don't change that physical experience that comes with it as well, our survival responses don't change. Yeah. That's still gonna be kind of there in the underground, lurking, popping up when we least expect it. And we wonder, oh, I just did all this work. Why, why am I keep running into these blocks? Why am I still feeling like the world's a dangerous place even though I've done this work that hasn't, that has told me otherwise, you know? Yes, it's both. We need to have that oh. mind and we need to have the body. And I think, this is where in, in our work with Rising Woman, we really do try to bridge that. Like we bridge, you know, we're doing ego work, but we're also doing the nervous system. We're bridging those together and you, you really can't separate the two. Yeah. And what I've, what I've loved about somatic for me was that I had done so many years of shadow work and ego work and really kind of purifying my mind. Um, but there were still patterns that were coming up in my body, like you say, like certain reactions, like when I was in conflict, how I would show up with my husband or how my nervous system would respond to threat. 
And no matter how much I worked on my mind or understood my own ego patterns or understood my shadow, those responses were still there. They were still alive. I could understand them a little better, but yeah. then make them go away. Yeah. So the somatic work is really about bridging that gap. It's about saying, okay, so you, you can understand these things, but now let's actually integrate. Let's help your nervous system get on board with what your mind already knows. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. important. Mm -hmm. bring it all into the picture yeah yeah and so when we're talking about trauma maybe we can dive into that a little bit and sort of help clarify trauma from a perspective of um sort of looking at what is trauma to us versus what society might deem as trauma mm -hmm. because you know, maybe even just 10 years ago, when we thought about trauma, we would think about, you know, you get into a car accident or something like that. Um, and it's only now that we're starting to see that trauma is actually quite unique. And there's not really a solid container that we can define it in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that trauma isn't the event. It's what didn't get to happen in our system. So it's that sense of the event can bring on trauma, but the event itself was probably traumatic, but it doesn't cause trauma. It's our body's response or lack thereof of response mm -hmm. that brings on the trauma, mm -hmm. causes that sense of stuckness, of that incomplete survival response where it's like, whoa, I was just in a car accident. Or even if we take a car accident as an example, two people can be in the exact same car accident, but one person might experience totally dramatic, not dramatic, but extreme situations, extreme symptoms, whereas the other person might not experience anything at all. And that's based on their past trauma and how much regulation they had on board to actually process what happened in that one car accident. Someone had a lot of trauma on board and maybe their cup was full, so to say, they're gonna experience that car accident and the outcome from that car accident very different than someone who had more capacity on board, more regulation on board, and was able to move through that little tiny car accident that someone else might not have had that same response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and so can we talk about what some ideas or examples would be of different traumas? Because I've talked to people who, when they tell me their story, I'm like, wow, that must have been so hard for you. That must have been so traumatic and they're like oh well it wasn't that bad because you know these other people have suffered so much more and so you know we tend to do this comparison and then invalidate our experience um so how can we speak to that a little bit so that people can start to self-validate their experiences a little more yeah i think i'm trying to decide where to start to start more talking about the different types of trauma and validating that or validating more the nervous system and where we're kind of stuck mm -hmm. i might talk nervous system first and then we can go a little bit more into the actual specifics of like what is trauma and all the different types of trauma um because ultimately when we're dealing with trauma we're stuck somewhere within these different states and these states are relative to the autonomic nervous system which is responsible for us surviving it's responsible for us surviving in all levels whether it's like danger survival or just thriving surviving mm -hmm. and there's a number of different states a number of different branches within that nervous system and I'll start with kind of the slowest the bottom and then work our way to the top the slowest response would be freeze, which I'll talk about in a sec because it's a really important one. But it's something that our nervous system does if we're in total danger. It's like, nope, shut it all down. Let's just preserve ourselves, right? And that's the dorsal branch of the parasympathetic. I'm going to throw some brainy words out there that don't worry too much about it, but just kind of see if you can follow along more on these states and these experiences and see if you can even feel in your body if what I'm describing relates to you or it's something that you're like, yeah, I get that. I totally understand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, first state is kind of more of a free state. Talk about that more in a sec. The other piece of that dorsal branch is resting and digesting. Mm -hmm. So that dorsal vagus, the vagus nerve, 
part of it being the dorsal, it's kind of responsible for like slowing down, right? I can rest, I can digest, and then if I need to, boom, brakes are on all the way, I'm totally shut down. Really important for us to have both of those states. Then kind of the next branch outside of that would be feeling safe and being able to socialize. Still part of this parasympathetic branch, and it's called the ventral vagal nerve. Again, brainy word, doesn't really matter. With that, it's important to feel safe, be able to connect with people, um, really be able to feel like yourself, right? Really be able to engage and feel, feel heard, feel seen, and um, also be seeing other people, be able to hear other people. We wanna be able to be present and engaged, and that's easiest to do when we feel safe. So really, really, really important state to be able to connect with. Then as we kind of move up the ladder, some people will say, we're moving into more sympathetic energy. So out of that parasympathetic, that's more about resting and digesting and feeling safe and more into some sympathetic energy, meaning more action, right? Right now I'm talking, my heart's beating a little bit more, I've got warmth, my hands are moving. I'm still engaged in that social engagement piece, but there's some sympathetic action on board. There's some blood moving more into my muscles. Same would be happening if I was doing some sports or going for a walk or a run, right? I'm moving more into being ready to respond. Step that up a notch into fear-based or anything that involves a threat to our lives, it's the same system. We're now just moving into more fight or flee response. So these are the responses I'm sure everyone's familiar with when it comes to survival, fight and flee, as well as the freeze that I mentioned earlier. So ultimately that fight flee is what really gets us like out of trouble, out of danger, right? We kind of just focus on survival at its max. It's like, what do I need to do to survive here? I'm not thinking about what I need to have for lunch. I'm not thinking about going to the bathroom. I'm not thinking about my crush. I'm just like, yep, let's do this. Let's survive. Let's get out of here, right? And in a healthy nervous system, we want to be moving through those states ultimately all the time based on what's changing in our environment. So if I'm sitting around watching Netflix, I'm going to be more in that low dorsal state, chilling, lying on the couch. Someone knocks on the door, I'm going to move into a little more of that, well, a little more synthetic, maybe a little more of that social engagement piece will be involved as well. We're constantly moving in and out of those states, adjusting to what's happening in our environment. Mm -hmm. right? Someone's at the door and I don't, I'm not expecting anyone, I might move more into that fear-based, like, whoa, okay, what? I need to do something here. I need to actually get up and lock the door quickly or whatever, right? And then once I realize, oh, it's just a friend, oh, I move out of that more fear-based response and that sympathetic fight flee-ish energy back into, oh, okay, I can socialize, I can engage. That's what we're ideally working towards is being able to move through these states as we need. Even that freeze state, if I'm in trouble and I need to shut everything down, I need that free state to be available, right? But the key is we don't wanna be stuck in any of those states. And this is where then the trauma comes in. When we've experienced trauma, we can often get stuck within that fight, flight, or shut down, freezy state. Then we have a hard time moving in and out of all those other states or even accessing them whatsoever with me so far totally yeah. cool. <laughs> so then when we're looking at trauma there can be a number of things that can kind of throw like throw a, throw us into a little bit of a dysregulation ultimately where we're not moving through these these responses and we're instead kind of moving into like whoa i'm up here in anxiety and I'm just like trying to survive, I'm trying to do what I can and I can't anymore and I crash and I end up more shut down and I don't wanna leave my house and I just wanna watch Netflix and dissociate, and disconnect from everyone and then friend calls and I'll like try to connect, you know, find a little bit of like, okay, I feel like myself again, but then boom, I'm way up in anx anxiousness again and just all over the place and then I crash again and I just go through these crazy dysregulated cycles versus moving through what needs to happen when we have regulation on board. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 
what can throw a curveball in all of that? There's so many possibilities. Um, trauma ranges from a shock trauma, where it's more specific to an event, something happened, like that car accident, and ever since I haven't been the same, right? I get in the car and I'm instantly anxious, or I can't even get in a car, or I can't drive on the freeway anymore, right? And it starts off with that, but that energy of still being kind of stuck in the response that didn't get to happen because of the car accident still is lingering within my system, and then it might start showing up in other things. I can't focus at work anymore, or, or I'm having trouble in my relationship, and you know, it's three years later, but there's still this incomplete energy there. My body's still trying to survive, and it's having a greater toll on everything that I'm doing. So that's based on like a shock trauma, one or two or three events. Um, that's ultimately easier to work with because it's like, oh, okay, we can pin back to like something happened here and you haven't been the same since. Let's work through that event and support the system to move through what wanted to happen in that car accident. Let's say, for example, you didn't get to cover your head when you kind of flew forward and ever since, you know, Things have been weird, not only in your neck, but also in your anxiety levels or you're, you know, able to even come out of feeling like you're in that survival state. So way easier to work with because we can work with the event. But there's all these other things that can influence that, including um, how was I before the car accident? Actually, right before the car accident, I had just gotten in a fight with my boyfriend and I was feeling super anxious already. And that fight with my boyfriend was based on not feeling seen. And that's because back in my childhood days, I was never seen. I always had to, you know, hide because if I was seen as myself, I'd get in trouble, right? Another form of trauma ultimately where there was danger. I wasn't able to be myself. So I had to mold myself, protect myself, do certain things to survive ultimately. Cause if I was myself, I wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I've got this like whole chain of other things that are kind of like backing the car accident that all of that is kind of needing to be unpacked as well, potentially. Mm -hmm. It could also be that, there's a background in developmental trauma from you know those very early stages where um, birth trauma, maybe something happened at birth, in utero, mom was stressed. In those first few years of developing, I wasn't cared for, I wasn't nurtured for. I had to literally learn how to survive from a very young age where you know I'd be crying that no one would come and help me because they weren't regulated enough or knew what to do to be able to support my system to develop in a way that felt safe and supported and part of something. And in that state, my, that social engagement piece never really got to develop properly. Right. Yeah. So trauma is so big and it's really hard to narrow it down to like, what's your trauma really? And that's why I really like, Peter Levine's work, Somatic Experiencing, and Kathy Kane's work, and Steve Terrell's work, which is more based on developmental trauma, where it's more about, okay, we have all our past, we have everything that happened, but how are you showing up right now? Yeah. What's happening right now? You know, because we can get so lost in like, oh my gosh, my childhood looked like that, my, my relationships with my parents looked like that, my, you know, my, I had, my relationship with my abuser looked like that. My, the surgeries I had when I was younger looked like that. We can get so caught up in that, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. All we have is right now. And we can support what's happening right now. We can start to really teach the system how to move through those incomplete responses, as well as build a really solid foundation that may not have been built when we were younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's like how to actually show the system ultimately rewrite the story that you can be safe yeah. you can be seen you can be connected with you're not alone you don't have to hide 
You don't have to be surviving, right? Really working with what's showing up right now and how do we start to really teach the system that you're here and it's okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think what I've looked at in my own system is that I sort of did things in, in the opposite way, you know, I focused really on the mind and the shadow work, the inner child work, all of that stuff for years and years and years. And then when I had almost like the mindset or the mental stability to handle the physical stuff, then I went into it. And I think there's two ways that you can do it. You can either start by working with the nervous system um, and then work on the mind, or you can work on the mind and then the nervous system, or you can integrate them both. And for me personally, when I think about it, when I started doing really deep somatic work, some of my traumas really did start to really flood back to me. And I started to have flashbacks. I was having a hard time with that. I started to sort of relive some of those traumas for a while when my nervous system was moving it out. And so I was really grateful that I had done all that work on my mind and that I had done you know, the time to understand some of my past conditioning so that I could sort of talk myself off the ledge. Yeah. So I think important. that's where it's useful is knowing that, you know, it's not one or the other. These really do work synergistically. Um, but sort of knowing that either way, you're going to need to be prepared for what comes. And I think if I hadn't done that work on my mind or I didn't have that solid foundation, it would have been really easy for me to feel the fear and then either turn back and like go back into whatever coping mechanism kept me the safest um, or to make up a story about it. Um, and that story would probably be fear-based if yeah. I didn't understand it. And so this is why I feel like understanding that when our nervous systems are dysregulated from trauma, not only are our bodies going to react and they're going to go into one of those states like fight or flight or freeze, um, but that they're also, we're also going to have the mind that's going to try to step in and make sense of what's happening in our body. Yeah. Our body is so well. Secret. Yeah. So we really have to watch when, when the physical thing happens that we don't immediately go into the mind and try to make sense of it instead coming back to the body. Yeah. Sending it as dysregulation rather than evidence that, you know, see the world isn't safe. I'm not safe. It's not okay to connect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think having the story piece is so important because it does, it helps us understand the bigger picture, right? Mm -hmm. It helps us piece together the puzzle in so many different ways. It's like, okay, I've done all these, la the, this layer, these layers, and now I'm doing these layers and then how beautiful it can all just integrate. Cause it is, it's, it's all of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, what I love about your work, it's like this invitation to dive into these layers of what makes us us ultimately. And then it's like, okay, and now notice how this is arising for you. And now how do I support what's here now with this knowledge from the past, right? And this understanding of like, who am I and why? And then boom, and this is there. And then, oh, interesting, as I stay with what's arising in what's happening as I explore this stuff, I can start to transform, mm -hmm. right? You can really start to piece together those past experiences into how you're experiencing yourself now and then change happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And when I think about integrating somatic work, it's just the obvious piece because until I started doing it, like I always knew that I needed to, to integrate the somatic piece, but I hadn't really experienced it. And once I started doing it, I was like, oh, wow, this is some of the most powerful stuff I've ever gotten into. I've explored so many healing modalities and I was amazed at how quickly my body would start to talk to me. And I could literally, when I was on the table doing table work with my therapist, I could literally feel my organs releasing certain patterns like different coping strategies or defenses and I could feel them like moving out, you know? Um, and so first I want to kind of go back a little bit to how we can identify, like what are some of the behaviors or the um, physical signs that we might be dysregulated? Um, one for me was really noticing that I often had my hands clenched when I was out in public and I wouldn't even notice it. And then I would, you know, I would realize my hands are in a fist. I mean, that's sort of like, I'm defensive. I'm, yeah. So how can we notice if we're dysregulated? I think 
understanding what it means to be in survival. Like if we think of those survival states, whether it's shutting down or being in more of that fight flee energy, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Right? Okay. If I think of being in more fight energy, I feel myself getting bigger. I feel my, you know, I feel this sense of like wanting to stand my ground. Um, if I think of a flea energy, it's more of a sense of like wanting to go, like there's this energy to it, right? If I think of freeze, it's like I totally am disconnected with my body. I'm not really disconnected with, or I'm disconnected with where I am. So then if I'm noticing those states in situations where they don't necessarily need to be there, then that would be a great sign. Oh, interesting. I'm noticing myself in more of a survival response right now, even though it's safe mm -hmm. and I'm okay, but I'm noticing this like new energy, right? Or however it shows up for, for you. It's like investigate what, what would it look like to be in more of that survival state versus feeling safe mm. and then starting to just be curious and okay I'm noticing this is showing up right I, I'm talking to a friend right now and I'm noticing that my hands are clenched or I'm, I'm feeling myself pull back and I'm feeling my eyes widen a little it's like oh interesting there's some survival energy there yeah mm -hmm. yeah just becoming familiar with the language of your body and on contrary, how do you know when you're safe? Yeah. Some people don't even know what that feels like, what that looks like, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So then how do I know I'm in less survival? Mm -hmm. How do I know I feel more like myself? How do I know I feel more connected, mm -hmm. less in fear? Right? And really starting to investigate what that looks like to you, mm -hmm. how that feels in your body, how, how do you not just know, but know, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I was thinking about that myself. When when did I really learn what it meant to feel safe? And I, I can honestly say that it was probably just a few years ago. Um, because even though, you know, my mind knew that I was safe, I was really seeing that, oh, my body doesn't know that at all. That's why, you know, my husband could just walk around the corner and we've been in the house together all day and I would fly and hit the ceiling. And it was like, he couldn't surprise me at all. It was like, even if he was there one minute and then he turned around and was there the next I would jump I was right. so jumpy all the time and uh, I realized that my mom is like that too and I sort of just inherited that nervous system because I had never been able to co-regulate with anyone um, to learn how to soothe myself and so everything was a threat even though my mind wasn't saying that it was a threat and I was like wow, it's really surprising that I just can't handle like basic things in my environment coming into my reality. Um, but when I started to do the somatic work, I noticed that it, that drastically shifted. And I, I can't remember the last time that I had a response like that. And that's my whole life I was doing that. And so it's really big for me to notice such a shift. Like this work really does work. That's why I wanted to interview you and I want more people to know about what you do to be able to join your groups and take your classes because uh, it makes the world of difference when all of a sudden your body knows you're safe. You can be a better partner. You can be a better parent. You can be better for yourself. You can engage in conflict in a way that creates more connection rather than disconnection. And these are all things we can't do when we're dysregulated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how about, um, I think we kind of just went off into that, that place of what we can and can't do based on our regulation, right? Like, so when we're talking about trying to engage in the healthy conflict or disagreement, um, when we're dysregulated, versus when we're regulated, those are going to be two very different experiences. Mm -hmm. right? Trying to engage in conflict when we're completely dysregulated, our fear response is so high, it's almost not possible. So maybe we can speak to that a little bit for people who are maybe stuck in patterns in their relationships, maybe with their family or with their you know, loved ones, their spouses, um, people who maybe feel like they can't speak up for themselves at work. Um, they want to, they know what to say and they say it perfectly when they're in the shower or with the person that they feel safest with. But then when they get into um, certain relationship dynamics, it's just, it's not possible anymore. What yeah, happens? totally. So what happens there is we get shot into overwhelm. And when we're in overwhelm, it's really hard to stay present or be in any 
ultimately control of what we're doing. We're just in full survival mode at that point. Um, so ideally when we're, you know, exploring everything, we want to try to stay within our capacity. We want to stay with, some people will call it the window of tolerance right? If I'm within that window, I'm able to at least be a little more conscious of what I'm saying, what I'm doing, what's happening for me in my felt experience, and I can support myself there. But as soon as I'm in that overwhelmed state, it's like, whoa, okay, shit's at the fan for lack of better words, now what, right? And I think just like we were saying, noticing where you're at in survival states, like recognizing what it feels like in your body, that can be really helpful because as you're dealing with conflict, maybe you even right before you're about to deal with conflict, you can already sense yourself moving into some survival response. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, whoa, if I take this step and start to say something, I know I'm going to get shot up into overwhelm and I'm, I'm gone. I'm not going to win this. I'm not going to be able to say what I need to say or, or really even be able to hear what they have to say. Cause it's just like, I already know that that's the path I'm going down. So before that even happens, is there room for me to support myself? Right? How early can I sense that I'm moving into some sort of prep pattern of needing to, you know, survive versus just be present and be able to, to share what's going on for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, what's the earliest indicator and how do I kind of hang out with myself there? And what tools do I have to support myself there? So instead of kind of being right on the edge of overwhelm when I move into that conversation, I can actually settle a little into feeling more connected with myself before I move into that conversation. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done because sometimes conflict just happens like that. And then it's like, okay, well, now I know my pattern. I know that when there's conflict, I want to rage or I want to shut down, whatever it is. Um, or I want to run away, right? We all love running away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm there with you too. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So then it's like, okay, well, I know my pattern. And how can I share that that's my pattern with my partner? So that when it arises, it's like, okay, I know I'm moving into this pattern. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to, I need some time to, for you to let me do that. And then I'll come back and, and support myself to come back into this capacity, into this window where, okay, I feel a little more able to stay connected with myself and then have this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think a big part of it is learning to listen to what's happening in your body, becoming familiar with your own patterns. Um, I know for me, for anger, for example, I could feel it like start in my legs and come up really fast. And I, I would want to just like yell, but then it, I wasn't feeling heard. I wasn't feeling like, you know, my point was getting met. So then I'd get defensive and then I'd want to run. That was my, my familiar, very familiar pattern. But the more I became familiar with the pattern, the more I was able to slow it down and be in it sooner. So I could feel the anger start in my thighs and like start to build up and I could slow that sensation down and, and be in that anger response before moving into that, like, rah, and then the defensiveness and then the wanting to run. So the more we can start to just be curious in our patterns from a somatic place, like being interested in what do I feel when I move into this pattern I'm familiar with and how do I support myself sooner? Cause if we're sooner, then we're not at that edge of like overwhelmed. Yeah, when I think about the uh, the nervous system pattern of you know having this big buildup and then just you know exploding or um, whatever criticizing, blaming, I've caught myself in that so many times. And what I've started to realize is that whenever I'm doing that, what's happening is that I'm actually overwhelmed with the amount of energy in my body, and I want to get rid of it, and so I'll like throw it at my husband right? Because like, yeah. I'm feeling stressed and pressured when we're leaving the house. And so instead of just working on that for a moment and just grounding, I'll, you know, say something critical, or I'll tell him to stop rushing me, or I'll just be a little bit edgy. And the more that I do that, the more I catch my, oh, right, I'm trying to get this energy out of my body, but it's not fair to be throwing that at him. Yeah. You know, I need to take responsibility for what's happening inside of me. And if I were to just 
soothe myself for a moment, then I could come from a more grounded place and have a healthier relationship with people around me. And so we have to sort of be able to notice what's happening when we're getting overwhelmed and be like, okay, I want to get rid of this energy because it feels too much. And sometimes maybe having a mantra could help. Like, it's okay to feel this way. It's Mm -hmm. safe to feel. It's okay to be in my body. I can move through this rather than just the unconscious. This is too much. Let's get it out. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if there's energy that wants to move, how does it want to move? Can you give yourself space to you know, connect with that energy. And it's like, oh, that energy feels like a rah, you know, and I just want to like, <laughs> and I can still move the energy and feel the energy or connect with something that helps me, yeah, really be in it and move through it versus, okay, let's just shove this under the table or keep lashing out and, you know, doing what I need to do because that's what I know how to do. It's like, how can something different start to happen? Yeah, I just had this vision of all of us being so self-expressed and oh my gosh, really just, you know, feeling our feelings in the moment and moving the energy and like, you know, you're walking down the street and someone's like roaring and this other person's like flapping their arms around and one other person's like air kicking and then they're like, ah, I feel better, you know? And I think <laughs> um, we've been so conditioned, especially in North America. I mean, in other parts of the world, you know, there's like lots of, there's dancing, there's energy, there's, you know, there's like, you look at the Hakka, for example, um, there's all of these cultures that are really self-expressed and they allow themselves to move energy. But over here, we don't really do that, do we? And so, and so, but we're actually very wound up. (laughs) Yeah. And we're so wound up. And so um, in, in some ways, this work is so, so important for people in this part of the world. Um, because we really don't give ourselves permission to feel our energy, let alone express it in any way. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. ultimately, all emotion is, is energy. All our survival responses are, is energy. It all is something in movement. It wants to move, right? And we're so good at, nope, oh, just contain it. And that being said, sometimes it feels like too much. Like if I were to express this, it's too much and we have to contain. There's like this dance in between contain because it feels like whoa way too much but then also how can I express a little a little and see what happens am I still okay or nope do I need to contain again Mm -hmm. but ultimately working towards yeah kick drops and rars all over the sidewalks that'd be great (laughs) (laughs) I think the thing is is that you know most of us myself included our our experiences in early childhood of anger were that of threat um, yeah. and a lot of us weren't modeled what it looks like to have a healthy expression of anger. So we wired in that anger is not safe because the truth is, is that for the most part, it's not because we haven't learned how to express it in a self-responsible way. We see anger as something that hurts other people, but what would it be like if, as you say, you know, you could just let out a roar or you can go scream, you know, into a pillow. I used to, we used to have this exercise in our shadow work groups where when we would get angry, we would just go scream fuck you into a pillow. Yeah. Um, and Ben and I used to do that. If we'd be in a fight and we'd just get overwhelmed, we'd just both sit down and scream, fuck you into a pillow. Amazing. <laughs> and honestly, a few minutes after we could go from fighting to like laughing hysterically because it was so ridiculous. Our nervous systems, we were just overwhelmed. We needed to move the energy. We didn't need to attack each other. Yeah. Um, and so it's really moving from that place of projection where we want to just offload our energy onto other people and really saying, you know what, I can actually... I can have this. It's okay. And it doesn't hurt other people if I'm responsible with it. If I let myself feel this, nobody's going to get hurt. And um, I think that's the fear for a lot of us is we've seen other people be hurt or we've been hurt ourselves. So of course, we don't want to do that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because those people we saw that anger from also didn't have a healthy expression of anger. Yeah. Right. It's like our perception of what anger, angry, anger looks like is not necessarily anger in its healthy form Mm -hmm. or any emotion in its healthy form. Totally. And, you know, there's, there's a few ways that we can express anger, you know, on the more, you might say aggressive side, like, you know, air kicking in your bedroom or going out in the backyard and throwing punches at the air or screaming into a pillow. But you can also do other things. Like I used to just turn music on really loudly and just dance. 
Mm. And when I started dancing, it was like that fire, because that's the energy of anger. That fire was moving through me until I felt really empowered and passionate. So I could use that energy and transmute it into something creative, um, which is what we can do if we use our bodies. And yeah. so um, that's why I, I loved somatic work, because it really is just about letting your body do what it wanted to do all along. Yeah, totally. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So can you give an idea of, you know, where somebody might start when they're like, okay, I want to rewire some of these patterns in my nervous system. I don't want to react the way that I react anymore, or I want to feel safe and I just don't know how. What are the places that people can start? So many. <laughs> I think as we were saying earlier, awareness is, is key. Awareness of what's happening in your body. Mm -hmm. um, awareness and curiosity are two really important words to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what, what is happening for me? And then can I be curious about it? Mm -hmm. right? Can I be curious about what else wants to happen from here? Or what's stuck and okay if I give myself a little bit of space what happens with that stuck part right? mm -hmm. um I think something to really play with something that keeps kind of popping into my head right now is something called the trauma vortex and the counter vortex mm -hmm. I think that's really important to recognize so when something's I'll explain the trauma vortex and the counter vortex and then give a few tools. So this is Peter Levine's model of understanding trauma. It's kind of like we're flowing down the river of life, doing our thing, and then in comes something that happens, some sort of traumatic event, and I kind of get sucked over into that. There's a bank, um, the, what's it called, the bank? The bank of the river kind of gets disrupted and I kind of get sucked over here and I get caught up in my trauma response. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm over here in my trauma response kind of disrupted from this flow of life. And, you know, I'm stuck over here and I can continue on in my life, but I still have this energy of kind of being stuck over in this trauma vortex. Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize that with every trauma vortex comes a counter vortex. So with every trauma vortex, there's this other side, mm -hmm. right? That, that is, ultimately liberating that is more connection that is more um presence that is more you in your essence right and when we're starting to pay attention to our the language of our body i wanted to bring this up because it's important to recognize as we learn to pay attention to our, these responses it's important not to just get sucked into them and kind of try to understand them and try to solve the problem it's like how do i get curious about this but also notice this other piece so i can pendulate in between the two so it's like okay i'm noticing that um i'm at home i'm stuck at home right now and i'm experiencing a lot of anxiety anxiety is a result of trauma right so i'm feeling this anxiety that's part of this trauma vortex great i'm becoming familiar with it i'm noticing the shape of it i'm noticing the intensity of it i'm noticing the thickness of it i'm getting really curious about this felt experience mm -hmm. right that's something we can start to do but what else is happening like where do i feel more most connected and what happens when i venture over there or what what happens when i kind of connect with my feet on the ground or look out the window and then it brings me over to this counter vortex so there's this play that we can do with becoming curious and what my response is but making sure we're not getting lost in it consumed by it and just like getting all tossed around in that vortex ultimately and how do i remind myself that this is also here mm -hmm. because the more we start to connect with this other counter vortex the more our capacity can maybe start to increase we can become more connected with another part of us that then helps us connect with this other piece again but we have a different way to be in it we have a different way to support ourselves in this trauma vortex which allows us to kind of support something new to happen instead of kind of always being stuck in this ugh. especially as we start to dive into this kind of work it's mm -hmm. so easy to be like whoa my body's speaking so much and i'm getting so caught up in it it's like yes it's speaking so much from a survival perspective but it's also got some other stuff going on and how do we bring ourselves also into that 
Mm -hmm. So that's one way to start exploring is you know, become curious of your patterns, what's happening in your body while you notice yourself in these patterns, but also what else is there that you can kind of bring your attention on to allow you to not fully get consumed by it, to kind of like brush the edges, support yourself, brush the edges, support yourself. So noticing at the same time as where you're maybe dysregulated, noticing where you are regulated or noticing where, where you are feeling good or noticing in the moments where you do feel really relaxed and acknowledging that too, rather than um, almost pathologizing the bad feelings and, you know, always being focused on how dysregulated you are, really taking the time to notice when you feel good, when you feel safe, when you feel relaxed, even if it's just small moments, you know, when you're walking by and you see some beautiful flowers, noticing how good that feels in your body. Or, you know, when you wake up in the morning after a really good sleep, you know, like little things. Totally. Because I think there lies such importance in connecting, uh, I'll use the word wholeness, mm -hmm. or our truth or our essence. There's such importance in like really bringing awareness to that part of us. Because the more we can connect with that, the easier it is to work through our trauma, the easier it is to work through our core beliefs and our conditioning, right? When we keep solidifying the sense of like, oh yeah, here I am, whole, connected, feeling good. And then, oh, here I am over there. Yep, roller coaster ride. But it's like, there's this underlying knowing that there's this part of me too. Mm -hmm. I love that. Beautiful. So with your work, are you doing, you're doing group work right now online? I'm doing, so I see clients one-on-one. -on -one. Currently my practice is full and because of that, my intentions are to build more of a program that more people can learn about this work because there's so much that you can do through education and through self-exploration mm -hmm. that can really support yourself. And obviously some one-on-one -on -one support might also be helpful in certain situations, but I do feel that just having some education on board about this work and understanding your body in a different way and having some tools on how to support yourself from that perspective can be really helpful. So I'm hoping to having, have my program up end of April, beginning of May, mm -hmm. we'll see. Um, and hoping to also create more and more free content for that purpose too. Education and tools are so key. And then I have a six month program where I work with people both one on one and online, but that I only run once a year. So that won't be until the fall or early 2021. Okay. So I'm going to post links to your Instagram and to your site and all of the ways that people can find you in the show notes. Um, and just you're on Instagram as well. Yep. Like your name, Nicole Lowe's. Yep. And Lowe's. Yeah. Okay. Some, some random person that has Nicole Lowe's that has one picture. I know they're not real. I'm like, what? <laughs> but yeah. And Lowe's. Okay. Great. And then, yeah. And then you're, people are more than welcome to ask questions here and I can come in and answer or shoot me email and yeah so I'll have stuff up soon to yeah keep people educated and get the information out there to help complement everything else that's going on in the world mm, beautiful thank you so much for your time today this was great and um, thank you, Jay. sharing this with our community yeah so grateful to do that mm -hmm.